Okay, so what I'd like to do... <coughs> okay, what I'd like to do is to speak about some of my work on the economic of supply chain. A lot of the topic, are, a lot of discussion is conceptual, with some examples, but I think it has a lot of uh, practical <coughs> innovation for climate change. And I will also <coughs> relate uh, to some of the issues that are associated, uh, uh, for example, with biofuels. Okay, so the basic point is that I really believe that uh, we have to move uh, from economic analysis of firm to economic analysis of supply chains. And then I speak about two types of supply chain, innovation supply chain and product supply chain. And then I speak about some of the implications. Now, so I'll start uh, from the basic point. Uh, we, that uh, economic was developed in the 18th or 19th century. And in my view, economic theory is appropriate for the 19th century. It's not appropriate for the 20th century. I remember that uh, Rich Sexton gave an excellent presidential address, and he was basically confused with welfare economics. Every time, non-economists basically tell us, okay, how come that we, have a, we don't have a competitive model? Even in agriculture, we don't have a competitive model. But to some extent, I think we really have to rethink our, uh, our work. Now, I think Theodore Schultz really start uh, emphasizing a lot of this point. First of all, we have disequilibrium in the, mo uh, in the, in the modern system. Uh, we have human capital that is growing. Then you have the Schumpeterian element of uh, innovation and creative destruction. Then you have the cost theorem, that the notion of the firm is different changing. I think in Agic on the work of uh, Tom and the Swinner was really pioneering because they really realized that what we really have to do is to deal with value change. So to me, the, my starting point is that we have an economy with multiple number of uh, value chains. We have an economy with a lot of innovations. And we have to take into account in our analysis. And we have to discuss it with a lot of time uh, when it comes to, uh, to w with our students and our constituents. Every time that we have any problem, farmers complain, how come we have so many uh, big or small or middle-sized uh, processing facilities where we don't have understanding how, uh, how our supply chain work and how they operate and we cannot have a base for regulating. So my feeling is that, uh, and that, that, uh, to some, that one of the advantages of Agicon is that we can really try, to, given that we live in this world where we have part that is competitive but most part is not competitive, to start to think differently about economics. Now, I, I really think that there are two types of supply chain that are really crucial. There are hundreds of supply chain and the changing, and the relationship is symbiotic. So, you know, I can spend hours on it, but I like to give to, to summarizing very fast. First are the innovation supply chain. These are the supply chain that result in new products. And they have elements like research, patenting, development, test, testing, and upscaling. And once you have an innovation supply chain, you have a product of services supply chain. And all these products are uh, changing and the relationship is symbiotic and uh, the system evolves. Uh, yes. So if I look at the innovation supply chain, so you really have several stages, the discovery, the development, the commercialization, and the marketing. And you have the vision of labor between universities, startup, and multinationals. And uh, in countries that you don't have these things, so to, to some extent in many developing countries, it's really uh, problematic. Now, and universities now change. They have offices of technology transfer. A lot of professors become entrepreneurs. I know that 20 years ago, when every time that the professor started the company, we have a demonstration in Berkeley. Now, Berkeley basically is the university that uh, have uh, mostly uh, businessmen that also teach. You know, Rouser is not an exception. He's becoming the rule. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately I'm the exception. But... but uh, so, so to some, and, and the same is true even in the Midwestern University. So to some extent, this is changing, and it's not all over the world. Now, this is especially important in biotech and in computer. But generally speaking, there are three types of uh, innovation supply chain. There is an educational industrial complex. There is a combinant innovation that someone has an idea and it's tries to use all the possible knowledge to make from this idea a new product. That's the example of Edison and Ford. They really took advantage of it. And then there is what is called re relentless innovation, 
which means that the company has a product and it all the time upgrades the supply chain in order to move forward. And you see what happened, for example, uh, in a cell phone. When you start a company, the, when, when you have a company that doesn't innovate all the time, they go out of business. So, you, so Motorola is out and the Apple is in. And then there is something that I call pivoting, and that, uh, that you have a supply chain and suddenly you have an obstacle, and you, and, and you move forward. That's what happened during the pandemic. Now, so as I said before, I said that you really need to move from economic of, uh, the economic of the firm to economic of supply chain. And the key point is that how you design a supply chain. And I think that generally when you have a product today, you have, you have some sort of a feedstock or intermediate input processing and final consumer. You can make it much more complex. But generally speaking, you really have to have an optimization problem. You have to decide how much to produce, how much input to produce in-house, how much input to produce to buy from others. You take into account processing costs. And there are many, many examples. Uh, one example I always like to have is export of flour from Kenya. Some uh, Danish guy decided uh, to grow, uh, the development of, uh, to grow flour for Kenya. First, they developed some airport with the processing facility and developed the, the production facility. And later on, the supply chain grew up. Some of it is done by the entrepreneur, the other is done by other. Supermarkets are the same thing. They have generic and they have other products. Obviously, if you look at Apple, Apple Company, not uh, even though it's an agricultural event, Apple Company is an example of how you're managing supply chain. In the beginning, it was vertically integrated. You know, the guy did it in his uh, father's garage. He sold, it, uh, he produced, uh, he designed the computer and sold them. Later on, he realized that it, they should be in the middle. Have other people produce uh, the, the feedstock. They will design it, and then uh, later on they re realize that they should also make money for marketing. So design of supply chain is really, really important. So when you have an entrepreneur that controls a product all the time, he's seeing how to design supply chains. Biofuel is another example. Actually, I got into this business when I started working in, uh, in biofuel, and the big element was that uh, BP said, OK, how we design a biofuel supply chain? How can we make sure that people will provide the feedstock? And uh, I look at the biofuel in Brazil and the US. In the US, people developed cooperatives that were processing uh, corn from farmers. And in uh, Brazil, it was vertically integrated because you have big latifundias that produce enough sugar so they can produ uh, produce the biofuel at hand. And so when you look at this industry, design of supply chain is really, really important. And when you have a supply chain, a lot of time you have multiple products, you have multiple residues. So when, for example, in the US, when you produce biofuel, you have the, uh, you have the ethanol and then you have the DDDs. So again, we need another supply chain. So we really have to think in these terms and how they affect it. Okay, so, so generally, uh, so, so if you're an innovator, you really have to decide about how much to produce, how much this thing we, uh, do, uh, you buy, how much uh, you make, what with the capacity. Then in the long term, you have to think about uh, uh, choices. And there are a lot of interesting things that we have. The entrepreneurs have a lot of uh, market power. It can be a monopolistic or monopolistic. It's, middleman is not rare. Apple is a middleman. It's not something that you, that you step in. The norm is competitive and monopoly is rare. The norm is some sort of uh, monopoly. Then you have the credit, that are, uh, credit uh, <coughs> risk, and others. And another thing that is important, when you start uh, any supply chain, you all the time think about demand. You have some sort of rational expectation of demand, maybe the best model that you have. So to some extent, demand creates supply, and supply creates demand. So I have this mathematical model, I don't want to show it to you, but, uh, but generally, you know, but you believe me, and if you don't believe me, I think it, it don't, I, I, I have so many mistakes, and now it's relatively clean. So generally, you have re <laughs> revenue minus uh, processing cost minus the uh, cost in-house minus the uh, 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 buying from other, and you have uh, some first order conditions that basically tell you that uh, the marginal revenue equal to the marginal processing cost plus the marginal cost inside. Generally speaking, what happens is that 
every time that you buy from other, you have, a mon you, you have some monopsis on its power. Every time that you produce something yourself, actually you produce more because you only take marginal cost, not marginal expenditure. And uh, that's not the, the point is, so generally uh, what happens is that uh, you have monopoly and monopsis uh, profit, and you diversify production from external and internal sources. Now, if, of course, you have risk, you take it into account. If, for example, external uh, source is not reliable, you produce more things in, uh, internally. So, so this is the basic model. Now, the one thing about all this stuff, that when you look in terms of supply chain, market are endogenous. I think this is, I know that other people said about it, said, said it before, but this is really a, a crucial point, that we all, all the time look that market exists. Market are created all the time. Every time you design a supply chain, you design product, and you design, uh, and, and you design a, a, a market. And, when you, and wherever you have an entrepreneur, they expect to make extra profit. The idea of normal profit is a fiction that doesn't really exist. I don't know any entrepreneur that would like to make normal profit. So, oh, what was doing? Okay. So, so generally speaking, this is my model of Apple. They are a monopoly, they are a monopsony, they make tons of money. And I don't think that people uh, complain. The only thing that will kill them in the long run is that, uh, that, is that you have uh, some sort of, uh, that you have uh, some sort of uh, new, a, new, a new system, that, uh, a new firm that will move to multiple, that result in a, a monopolistic competition. Now, when you look at this, I don't have a lot of time to deal with it. You have different type of uh, institution. You can have vertical integration. You can have contract farming. You can have a plantation. Uh, that buys from others. So there are many ways uh, to look at it. Now, there are a lot of, uh, in the long run, there are a lot, uh, you have to decide about investment. Supply chain is about investment. So you have a long term uh, decision how much you invest. And again, you have the same thing. You have, you, you have some uh, first order conditions that you expect to have where uh, you maximize net present value or expected net present value. And you invest, again, as long as expected the marginal uh, rate of return from innovation is greater, uh, is greater uh, than, the, than the marginal, uh, uh, than the net present value of the, than the cost of, as long as the ex expected mar uh, discounted marginal benefit of, uh, the, of investment is greater than the cost of uh, capital. Now, uh, the, so, so to some extent, uh, you, you realize that you can really take standard economic model and move to supply chain, and then you can play a lot of games. This is only the beginning, you know, like uh, if I was younger, I think I know what I would do for 50 years, now I have about five. But anyhow, but generally when you look at, uh, at supply chain, a lot of the initial uh, level of supply chain depend on R&D. If, uh, if, if the government did a lot of research, you don't need to worry uh, in, in, to develop a lot of research yourself. If, the, if you don't have a strong public uh, sector research, then you have to, inv to invest a lot of money to develop the capital. And that's the reason that in countries like the US that you have a lot of research, the public research through the defense segment USDA and other, you're doing much better than other countries where you don't have a lot of public research. Now, of course, the innovation, the behavior of innovation uh, changed over time. They move from one market to another. We assume that demand is uh, something constant, but we have a lot of markets. So one of the big changes of any uh, innovator, anyone that managed supply chain, is where to move, what will be the next market. And if you look at I, I really, if you look at McDonald's, they started in America and they have a certain supply chain where they buy, uh, they buy real estate and have, uh, uh, and have people that basically they, they use as their dealers. And then they realize that the next country is France and then now they move to China and in every country to think about a, a supply chain. And the same thing is true in every, so this model you can really, you can realize how you move from one place to another and then uh, how you introduce learning by doing. And we can move from a two-state supply chain to a s several state supply chain, but the same principle applies. Now, one of the key elements is credit is fi and finance. I think that one of the things that uh, uh, I remember my first paper that I sent uh, when I was a graduate student uh, was rejected. I sent it to AR and 
Man, this was really an embarrassment. They said terrible paper, uh, terrible idea, terrible authors, and you don't know that, the, and, and you assume imperfect capital market. It doesn't make sense at all. So anyhow, so, that's, so we, we know that capital markets are not perfect. And when you speak with anyone that deals with supply chain, you know that, that credit is really is, is very important. So if you look at basic research, the credit comes from government. And if you look at uh, development, it comes from venture capital. It comes from a development fund, from self-finance. So to some extent, government that don't have a mechanism, countries that don't have mechanism for development basically don't have new industries. I think the key, for example, the reason California is so successful to some extent is because we have all these uh, uh, organizations that started on the movie industry that basically give you uh, money based on, uh, based on trust, and we have venture capital. A movie producer is a venture capitalist that do, that do sexy things. And uh, then when you look at, uh, uh, when, when you look at upscaling, you have a hedge fund and stocks. And then later on, you start having bonds and... Uh, now, if you're a consumer, you have credit card. I think that these are things that you really need to understand in order to understand how supply chain uh, operates. Now, so, so of course, uh, uh, so of course, there are a lot of political, uh, uh, political, economic issues. For example, access to land is a big issue. Uh, someone wouldn't go to Brazil to do a lot of stuff because he has limited uh, access to land. So if, for example, you allow to have 50% access to land, you'll go there. If you understand what China is doing in Africa, part of it is, a, a part of it is a political economy, but part of it because you, they have much more access. Then you have issues of accommodation to stand or, of environmental issues. I, I, I don't want the to topic all by itself. What's going on here? Gosh. I don't know, sir. I don't know why it refused to move. Oh, okay, uh, okay. So, so, so supply chain evolves. Another thing is 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 a, is, a, is a notion of uh, pivoting. When you every time that you have a crisis, you have to modify supply chain. You saw it in the pandemic. I think the pandemic was a huge success of uh, agriculture around the world. I think, given with uh, things that uh, with the fact that you basically have social distancing and people stay home and got stuck, and uh, the fact that we were able to feed most of the people in the world and the number of uh, reduction in food security was minimal is incredible because supply chain pivoted. Almost all over the world, we have a paper, you can see that people suddenly digitize their supply chain. So a lot of time, you have an innovation, it's like the Dixit and Pindek model, that is there for a while, and then when the moment occurs, people adopt it very fast. So to some extent, people say, gosh, well, why don't people adopt GMO? There is no condition to there. But the point is that we have so much capacity so that things will move forward. People speak about second generation biofuel. There were conditions to do it for a while, so people develop it. Now no one studies it, so the technology is about 70 years uh, behind till there will be the incentive to do it, and then it will move very fast. Actually, in this case, in the, that case, there was something very interesting. A lot of people start to get, uh, intel uh, thought that they will get a lot of genetic material from China, and then China realized what's going on and said, no way, you cannot use miscantas, you have to develop your own varieties. And we don't have a lot of domestic varieties, so some private companies basically not only have to pay a lot of uh, penalties in China, but they basically have to close their door. So to some extent, uh, if you have the conditions, if conditions change, you are able to adapt. Now, the first thing that you need to know is that regulators need to understand how supply chain work. work. You would never have a supply chain that is something radical that is as successful if you don't have demand. So the first thing about it, our two or three big success in climate change are electric car and uh, solar energy and wind energy, and they basically were based on some sort of Subsidization, because no one will get into this business if they are not subsidized. And if you look at the U.S. industry throughout the time, subsidization was a key element a lot of time, because someone assured you to have the initial demand, because the toughest thing is to have initial demand. It's not that I'm saying subsidize everything, but there is a case for infant industry. The question is that you need to be smart enough to know which infant, infant makes sense and which infant doesn't make sense. So electric car makes 
make sense, uh, some other thing don't make sense. Uh, the, the other thing is that a lot of time the role of the government is to provide the labor uh, the, uh, uh, to start a new industry. We, we will have a problem like the US now want to invest a lot of money to develop, uh, uh, to develop chips industry in the US and I understand that the Taiwanese say, God, we will ready to come but you don't have the manpower. And I think one of the biggest problems in the U.S. today is that we are really complaining about the rest of the world, but we have an uneducated ML power in many areas that we cannot uh, compete in some areas. So we really have to realize it. And uh, so to some extent, policymakers need to understand what are the needs of supply chain and what you need to do. Sometimes you have to build a bridge, sometimes you have to do research, sometimes you have to invest, but you have to speak with industry, and it's talent because you may be captured. So the point is that people say, don't speak with industry. If you don't speak with industry and innovator, who would you speak with? So you have to speak. You have basically to, to respect it and to be also uh, suspicious sometimes. Then we have the chicken and egg problem. And now, I, I, I was, Berkeley got a lot of money from Shell Oil. This is our new partner. We are moving. We got, uh, we, we got rejected by BP after the pay. This was a good divorce. We got $500 million, and now we have this contract with Shell. And I was responsible on designing a supply chain for, uh, uh, for hydrogen. And at the end, the price of oil went down, so decided not to do it. Now Toyota will do it. But the key point that I want to, uh, to make is that when you look at this designing a supply chain of hydrogen, it's a huge problem. You have to find a way to produce hydrogen. You have to find a way to develop hydrogen pipeline. You have to find a way to have uh, equipment to produce, uh, to use hydrogen. So you need to develop an alliance. So there is an alliance between Toyota and uh, Shell and other companies to do the hydrogen. The same, uh, now, when you look, for example, I, I'm not a big, uh, I think that hydrogen has its limitation. I actually think that biofuel will have still huge potential in the long run when it comes to truck. It's not clear that batteries will be so, uh, so great in, uh, with truck. And if you are able to increase productivity of uh, soybean, and people now can increase, uh, there are innovations that increase the efficiency of photosynthesis, you may be able to produce trucks that will rely on biofuel. So to some extent, there is a chicken and egg problem that is really, really, uh, that is really, really uh, quite, uh, Important. Uh, another thing, people now speak about sequestration uh, by uh, by plants uh, or, uh, or algae. These are these are great ideas, but you need to develop a supply chain. You need to develop first of all the research. Once you identify one or two home run uh, production uh, products that you can do, then you need to upscale it. So again, it's a combination of public and private collaboration. Now, no one will do it if there is no some sort of a price for carbon. Now, on the other hand, there is an interesting supply chain that most of you haven't heard about, which is a supply chain uh, using worms to produce, uh, to, uh, uh, to produce a protein. And the reason that you need a, to, you, a worm to produce protein is because you have a huge problem of, uh, <coughs> you have a, a huge problem of fish meal, and you, and you have a protein sorted throughout the market to so people now develop supply chain, and then again, Suddenly, when you have a supply chain, the biggest problem is regulation. If it will take you five years, if, if within three years you know that the product is okay, man, you go into it. If it will be 10 years, you don't go into it. So what I'm doing a lot of time, people ask me, can you do analysis? I say, okay. You can get the rate of return is inversely related to the, time, to the time of approval. So a lot of time as economists, we don't really look at this type of problem. Actually, what economists do now, they become a historian and they do all this rigorous uh, empirical analysis to discover what we knew before. But uh, <laughs> no, that's the state of economics today, you know, and you get a lot of money from Gates to do it. But the reality is to, I, to understand exactly what's going on. You need to understand our supply and what are the big concerns. That's the reason that I think that regulation are a real problem and you need to understand uh, what, they, uh, what, they, what they are. What, what's going on here? Anyhow, I guess I, guess, I, guess I went beyond my time. <laughs> <laughs> so what? <laughs> so anyhow, what's the time now? Okay, so that's about two or three minutes. So to some extent, I think that when we look at this uh, notion of, uh, what's going on here? 
Okay. So then now what happened is that more and more we will move to circularities. But the, the problem that Tom mentioned is that we use a lot of fertilizer and now all the all the rivers and the lakes are contaminated. So you need to develop systems that will be able to reuse all the stuff. And I think circularity is not something that is infeasible uh, technologically. It's something that is the issue of uh, policy. You have to think how you develop some sort of policy that deal with uh, some of this regulation. And again, it's the issue that in the US up to now we try to coddle the ag sector. With some, you may need to have a, a, a click and, a, and stick. But again, you really need to understand how supply can work. What would you do with the residue? How can you use them? And we need also the other thing we need to do. We need to start using life cycle analysis. I know that it has a lot of flaws, but engineers are using it. And you, find, you need to find a way to use it in terms of economics. So I think this is something that is really important. And one of the main advantages of Agicon department, they have people that do life cycle analysis. Well, economists told me that it's a stupid idea and it, no one should use it. It exists in reality and it's very important. So again, uh, environmental regulation, we need to understand how supply chain works. For example, uh, when it comes to, pest, uh, to regulation of uh, dairy products, you have to regulate both t Tyson, that uh, they design how the, uh, the chicken system or dairy system work, and the farmers, that, uh, the, or, or the uh, contractors that grow the chicken or the beef. But rather than to have a system that one party or another is uh, li uh, liable. So, the, so again, you need to understand our supply chain in order to have uh, environmental regulation that are reasonable. And supply chain are not only limited uh, to businesses. If you look at uh, water, water is a supply chain. And the way that you assign a property right and regulation and liability affect how the water system operates. So, so to some extent, I think to be effective, we need to be multidisciplinary. You need to know how things work. We need to understand our supply chain uh, operate. And we need to know some detail. It's not generic modeling. You need to understand different innovation systems, different technological systems, what type of uh, what type of trend, uh, what type of uh, supply chain are there? How do uh, how do in, how do finance and risk interact uh, with supply chain? And by doing it, I think we can really meet our, in my view, our biggest challenge, the uh, opportunity, the professor, uh, the profession, to be an integrating discipline, to take data from a lot of other disciplines and to put it together to have some sort of uh, ability to generate. Uh, Commercial, uh, a commercial enterprise that will solve problems rather than to be a little bit of a discipline on the side. Okay, that's it. Thanks.